Hello everyone, welcome to the recording for week two for digital photography. And as you can see, week two goes September 16th through 20th. Before we jump into week two, I want to discuss a couple of things. The first thing is passing plan. I've created a passing plan that will help you pass the class doing minimal work. Now, as I say here, I want all students to get high grades, but I know some of you just want to earn a passing grade. Well, this passing plan is how you can do it. And if you click on this, it'll take you to the doc share area, and the passing plan is loaded, uh, located there. And what I've done in that passing plan, I've taken some of the coursework, and I've showed what coursework you could do, the minimal coursework, to get a low D. I think it ends up being like 595 points or something. So it requires you to get 100% on assignments like write-ups, learning plan, finishing plan. Those are easy, 100%. And then maybe get like 70% on the big 100 points assignments or the larger assignments. Then you can even skip some work. So take a look at that passing plan. Again, it's in the doc share area. And there's digital photo passing plan. I'll go ahead and, and open it up so, you, so we'll take a look at it. Just take a quick look at the passing plan, explain it a little bit. So you can see that what I've done here is I've taken all the assignments and all the points possible for them, and I've put some suggested points, and all of this adds up to 595. So you see that you like you should get 20 out of 20 on the write-up, learning plan 25 out of 25. But I've taken into account that maybe you wouldn't get 100% on the unit exam. So you can see that on some of these you're not getting 100%. Even if you do better on some of these, then you don't have to turn in so much work. But I just wanted to line this out for you just to give you hopes of passing the class with doing minimal work. Now the other thing that I would do if I were you, if it gets down towards the end and you're really tight on points, you can always go in and do the, um, the unit exams and just try to get as many points as you can, even if you haven't covered the information. But don't do that yet. Do that as a last resort. Ideally, you would do work and earn your points, right? So I'll close that. But the idea with that passing plan is that it can uh, help you if you're struggling, if all you want to do is pass the class. So that for you, submitting work properly. Here's a video, a five minute video that will show you how to zip the assignments, how to zip your folder to submit work. If you don't submit properly, I'm not going to grade it. I'll just turn it back to you and say, please submit properly. So please watch this five-minute video, and that'll help you tremendously. A reminder, assignment directions. I'm going to post some directions in this announcement for assignments that I need, think students need um, additional clarification on. So always go to that before you send me an email about not understanding assignment. Go watch the, re the assignment recordings first. Uh, proper file and folder names. I've talked about that before. So just read through this. Make sure you, you name things properly, proper folders and things. All right. So week two. Week two, we're getting into the using your digital camera unit. And in this week, you're going to take your first few pictures and submit them. So, of course, you watch the recording. You're doing that now. You'll complete the write-up. And one thing about this, some students are having trouble watching the recording and doing the write-up at the same time. When you're watching the recording, you can hit the pause button and then go type in the answer in the write-up. So think about pausing and then doing the, the writing. And then I also have a, a reminder here. Go watch the submitting work video that I have. I just showed you that a minute ago. So in this unit... Three sections for the beginning of the week, and then three sections for the end, as well as doing your photographs. Now, to be honest with you, for the work for this week, if we think about it, watching this recording and the Class Connect write-up, this might take you a half an hour. This five-minute recording take you five minutes, right? Now, going through these sections, I mean, I'm going to go through these sections right now. So these are the sections we're going to cover. Then you take some pictures of your house, and then you have a unit exam. This week is probably no more than uh, three hours of work at the most. So pretty easy, isn't it? And I'll get, 
week three stuff posted, you can get a, get a jump on that if you want to. So week two is just going to be one unit. From here on out, though, week three, week four, week five, those are each going to be two units. So you're going to have a little bit more work to do. So again, in this week, your first photo assignment, you're going to shoot some pictures around your house. And then you have a unit exam. And as always, make sure you use the exam preview. And there's the exam preview right here on the left. So you'll find the answers to the exam preview from the lesson. lesson. Then you go do the exam. All right, I'm going to, uh, that's how it all works. Here's the, the using your digital camera, sorry, the using your digital camera unit. So uh, there's the using your digital camera exam preview right here. So that's week two. Now let's go ahead and jump into it. Let's look at the write-up first, as we always do, because I want to help you with the answers. So why do you have to adjust for parallax? What are the three types of viewfinders? And I want you to choose either portrait or landscape, give a specific example of when one would be better than the other to use. So let's jump into section two. So handling the digital camera. Now it's important, like it says right here, it might be pretty obvious how you handle a camera, but as this says, more photographs are ruined because the camera wasn't held, held properly. The photographer what they're seeing in the viewfinder they misinterpreted so a little bit of practice and work on that now can really help you out so the three things to look at describe the different types of viewfinders apply image orientation to the subject and learn how to hold the camera to be stable and we look into the viewfinder that's a little hole in the back of your camera you look into that and your viewfinder gives you a smaller frame or the, the pic camera actually takes a smaller picture than what your frame actually shows. So your viewfinder would show you this whole rectangle, but then your picture frame actually ends up being smaller. So you have to think about that a little bit. Now the other thing about the viewfinders is that when you look in them, they're offset a little bit, and we'll see a picture about that in a minute. So you really want to be careful. So what they're saying here is that when you're looking through your viewfinder, your viewfinder gives you this big, the rectangle here. What you really want to do is think of a box inside that viewfinder, and that's really the safe area for your picture. So don't always think of your picture taking the whole size of the viewfinder. Picture your safe area to get the best image is going to be within something smaller than the viewfinder. Now, there's something called parallax on cameras. And if you look at your digital camera, you're looking at the back of your digital camera and it looks right through this viewfinder. Well, this viewfinder is in the top left edge of the camera, right? But the camera takes a picture out of the lens. So you might see from this top part, you might see the top part of this person's body but the camera lens actually sees this part. So you really have, that's called parallax, the offset. The offset of the viewfinder compared to the lens is called parallax. So the reason you have to adjust for that, and the answer is to that write-up question, you have to adjust for that because the viewfinder sees something different than the lens sees. That's the reason you have to adjust for parallax. So what you have to do, it says like moving the subject down a little and to the right could help correct it. So you can experiment with your camera. And certainly that depends on where your viewfinder is on your camera. Now, I'm, I'm looking at my, my cell phone. And when I look at my cell phone, that's a little bit different when you're looking at digital viewfinders. This is when you're looking at optical viewfinders. But digital viewfinders, sometimes those give you the exact shot. Now, the other thing about this, parallax gets worse as you get closer to the subject. So if you're three feet away, you need to make some adjustments for the parallax. More about viewfinders. Oh, I actually need to go back here a little bit. So, so this is called an optical viewfinder, meaning that you look directly, you look um, directly through the viewfinder box. That's the optical viewfinder. Then other types of viewfinder, there's electronic viewfinder. And there are lots of typographical errors in this text. I can't believe it. Um, but I have nothing to do with that. Of course, as you know, these are made for us. So I really can't change that. So don't complain to me that there are typing errors in here. 
But, okay, electronic viewfinder. So this electronic viewfinder is like the viewfinders on your digital phones, or if you have your digital camera and you want to see um, the big image on the back of your digital camera, that's electronic viewfinder. And electronic viewfinders, you see almost the same image that the lens will take. So electronic viewfinder doesn't really have the parallax issue. So no problem with parallax usually on the electronic viewfinder. The only thing about electronic viewfinder on digital cameras is that it can really go through your batteries quite a bit. The last type of viewfinder is the reflex viewfinder. And this is the one in the digital single lens reflex cameras. So these are like the the old time cameras like before we had digital cameras that use mirrors and prisms and things and it's the, those nice digital cameras. And the um, so the digital SLRs they don't have so much problems with the parallax and they give you about 95 percent of the scene the, the entire scene. So there's the reflex viewfinder electronic viewfinder, and I mentioned before, there's the optical viewfinder. What about viewfinder? So here's an example of a digital camera, and this is the one that has the, this is the uh, digital viewfinder, and you can see that this uses lots of battery power. So you have the digital viewfinder on your camera, but you also have right up here, that would be what's called the optical viewfinder, because that's where your eye would look through. So you can use either one, but again, digital viewfinder, the display on the back of your camera, uses a lot more batteries. Or you have to keep charging your camera, different things like that. So as this says, there's nothing more frustrating, you go to take a picture and you don't have enough power, right? Also, the digital displays like this, it's very hard to see in bright light. So using the optical viewfinder is better in bright light. Here's a little self-check activity, go ahead and do that quiz orienting the camera. So there's two different modes, like there's landscape mode, so that would be wide, and then there's portrait mode. And also, like if you think, most of you have experience with printers and they say print in landscape or portrait, or like in word processing landscape or portrait. So um, what you want to do is um, determine which mode you want to use. So Landscape mode is if your image is wider than taller. Portrait mode is if your image is taller than wider. Now those aren't really specific ideas, but if you think down, if you look down here, people are standing up or even are sitting, if they're taller than they are wide, then you need to you know, hold it in portrait mode. Cars are wider than they are tall, so cars you might take in landscape mode. A house is usually wider than it is tall, so if something's wider than it's tall, then that's going to be the landscape mode. If something's taller than wide. So if you want to take a picture of a um, like somebody going up for a dunk on a basketball hoop, that's going to probably be taller, right? So then that would be portrait mode. So that Class Connect Writer question, I want you to give me, choose either portrait or landscape and give me a specific example of when, when one might be used over the other. Holding the camera. It seems a bit simple on the surface, but you want to give your camera a firm base. So stand with your feet about shoulder width apart, so nice broad stance. Elbows tucked into your side, so you can see how this lady's elbows are tucked in. That gives more balance, and you're not going to be moving the camera. It's not going to be bouncing around. Sometimes I even touch my elbows to my sides when I hold the camera. Hold the camera with both hands. You can put one on the bottom and then one on the side to take the picture. Operating the shutter, so of course you're ready to take the picture, right? And the shutter, you know, that's the button you push to take the picture, and sometimes there's going to be a little bit of a lag between the time the shutter is pushed and the photograph is taken. If it's in a darker situation, it could be a half a second. On well, the half a second, you could possibly move or your hands would jerk or something like that. So you need to be careful with that. Some cameras let you use what's called the half push, where you sort of hold the button down a little bit, and then that freezes the frame. Then when you're ready to take the picture, then you hit click, and it goes a little bit faster for you. But you really need to be careful with pushing that shutter button that you don't move your camera. So that's why people use tripods in darker situations, because the shutter is going to stay open a little bit longer. So the tripod will steady the camera. Opening the shutter, you want to be very smooth when you push the shutter in. Don't stab or poke at it. 
just be very very smooth as you uh, push it down. And uh, you know, one thing, if you stab at the shutter button, that'll turn the camera a little bit, and then you're going to have crooked pictures. So there's a little flashcard activity. Go through that to see what you learn about orientation of cameras. So let's go to the write-up. We answered all these questions. I do want to make sure that on this one, you're going to choose either portrait or landscape and give a specific example of when it would be better than the other. Okay, section three. The, um, what is the key to taking good photographs? Explain what program mode is for pictures. Compare overexposure to underexposure. Give an example of adjusting for negative or positive exposure. So digital cameras. So we've come a long way. Um, you know, there you have much more advanced control of light exposure with the sensors and things like that. So really, um, the key to taking a good photograph is judging the exposure. So being able to judge the exposure of an image, that's the key to taking a good photograph. So that's the answer to that Class Connect write-up question. Being able to judge the exposure of an image is the key to good, good pictures. So in this section, we're going to look at what makes a good exposure, describe exposure settings uh, for images, explain what compensation is on exposure, and how to uh, apply compensation exposure. So most digital cameras will give you a choice when exposing your photographs. Remember, exposing, expo exposing means how much light is reflected into the sensor in the camera. So a lot of cameras you can you can adjust the exposure yourself, but some of the more modern cameras, they can look at different areas in the image and they can determine how to set the exposure and the shutter speed and things like that. That's called program mode. So program mode is essentially the automatic mode where the camera examines the image and sets the aperture and the shutter. So that's what program mode is when they set when the camera sets it for you, does it automatically. And more about exposure. So take a look at this. Look at all the great, ex great uh, details here. Look how that, how sharp the edges of that shadow is, and how sharp you can still see the edge of this building against the shadow on the other building. You can even see this close-up corner of this building with a little bit of shadow. So this one is really exposed very nicely, although it does get washed out in the back a little bit. But I can still see all three of those buildings really clearly. I can see some nice shadows around the window. So you know, there are lots of things to think about when taking pictures. Make sure the shadows have detail, the lines of the edges of the shadows. Light areas need to have some detail. Colors need to look natural and real, right? And the color shouldn't, or, uh, there shouldn't be color cast over the image. So, some, so you really need to be careful when you take your pictures. And of course, some software can help you adjust some of the pictures. So a little bit more on digital exposure. So there's overexposure and underexposure. So overexposure is when there's too much light strikes the sensor. It might be if you're shooting into sunlight. And then underexposure is when there's not enough light. So to compare those two, that's what you would put. Overexposure is when there's too much light, and underexposure is when there's not enough light. That's the comparison of those two. So the, probably the biggest problem people have is with overexposure because they don't they, they shoot in, in too much light or more directly into the light, and then things get washed out with too much white in them. And here's a little bit on uh, camera exposure, so do a little crossword there. Exposure compensation. So program mode, that helps you. can solve most of your problems for you because it really examines what the image is going to look like. But there's also something called exposure compensation. This means where you can actually adjust your your picture yourself, the comp the exposure. So positive compensation, you will increase the exposure to let more light in. Negative, you will decrease the exposure. So positive compensation, you let in more light. Negative compensation, you dec you let in less light. And here are some examples. So if you're taking a picture of your friends on a sunny day, you don't want them squinting into the sun, right? So you um, turn them around so the sun is at their back. Well, now the sun is in your camera lens. So you want to change the, the uh, exposure. You want to do the positive exposure so it's going to let in less light. Another example, if you bought a car and you want to take a picture of it to send via email, the car is white and it's overexposed because of the sun. 
well, then you would do some negative exposure. So that it would make it a little bit more uh, darker and you could uh, see all the detail. So those are a couple of examples of how positive exposure and negative exposure can be used. Here's a little quiz. Go ahead and take that quiz. See how well you can do on that. So let's go back to the write-up. So we answered these questions, right? Com compare overexposure to underexposure. So you're going to write those both down, what they both are. Example of adjusting for negative or positive. So you'll choose either the negative exposure or positive exposure, and you will give an example of one of those two things. And we just looked at two examples. Section four, why would you change this folder name of digital images on your computer? So section four is all about moving your images. And some things, some people, they just keep the images on their memory card. If you have a camera that has a memory card, instead of putting it on the computer and clearing out the memory card, then the card fills up, they go buy a new one. Well, if they lost their memory card, then they've lost all their pictures, right? So it would be, and that really defeats the flexibility of digital photography. So it would be great to transfer your pictures to your computer. Moving your pictures. That's what we're going to look at now. So we're going to look at transferring from a camera to your computer, locating your transferred images. So moving your photos. Now, back in the old days, and still you might have one, there's a digital camera in its docking station. Then you would plug your computer into the docking station, and it would automatically transfer, transfer the pictures to your computer. And that was really nice. It was all done automatically for you uh, via USB cable and things like that. Now, a lot of you now, you might have a digital camera that has a cable, and you just plug the cam cable directly from your camera to your digital uh, to your computer via you know kind of a USB or a transfer cable. And that's really good too. And then you just take all those pictures, put them right on your computer. Perfect way to go about doing things. And then you can at least have them in two places, right, until you're ready to uh, erase the memory card. Then to, to transfer them, you know, here's a picture of a, a camera with a transfer cable going into the laptop. Now, the thing about it, a lot of times the transfer wizard will just put all the pictures in a folder. They call it a file here, but it's really a folder called My Pictures. Well, that doesn't help you very much. So this start, starts talking about um, the uh, renaming the files and folders. So like this, you have a folder called friends 6 08 so that means pictures of your friends back in June of 2008, right? So the reason you want to rename the folders on your computer for your pictures is so you know what the pictures are about. That's the reason you want to rename them. All right, using a card reader, I don't, I don't know if any of you are going to have a situation like this, but some of you probably have a card reader in a, a memory card in your computer in your digital camera and hope and you might have a laptop where you can put your card reader in and then you can get the pictures off of that card reader so same thing you'd want to make sure that you uh, use the right kind of a uh, folder name on your computer so that when you put get those pictures onto your computer you can organize your pictures successfully so here's a what did you learn or what do you know? So go ahead and do, do that little uh, activity there. Yeah, uh, so the write up. So we answered this question, didn't we? Why to change fold the digital, the, why change the folder name where digital cameras go, images go? We talked about that. Okay, last section three reasons to archive, and how can a good naming system for files and folders help you? So let's go to five right here. So before digital images, most of the storage space in a studio was devoted to storing images. So uh, photographers had negatives and they kept those in special places so they wouldn't get exposed to sunlight and things like that. So you, and then prints were, were kept in envelopes and such. So you had all this storage place, but now you know, with DVDs and memory sticks and everything, we can store pictures anywhere we want. So in this section, we're going to look at what archiving is. That means saving. Create a folder naming system, archiving your images, and how to safely store your archives. So here are a few reasons you want to archive. And what that means is to make a permanent copy outside of your computer. So here are a bunch of reasons. Hard drive fails, operating system come corrupt, somebody could steal your laptop, right? Soft laptop software becomes corrupt. You can have pictures accidentally erased. Um, so lots of reasons, but then one class never had a question said, what are three reasons you want to make sure you archive? 
And one way to archive, of course, would be to burn onto a CD or a DVD. So your computer would have that, that uh, 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 the ability to do that. And then you would just go to the folder where your pictures are. You'd hit send to, and then it would be burned on your CD or your DVD. That's one way to archive. And again, archive is like if you go to a museum and they have you know, all their stuff in their collection, it's called their archive because that's where things are saved. Well, same thing there. Archive meaning it's just saving things. Okay, naming folders. Again, we talked about that. You want to have a good folder naming system. So a good naming system allows you to go back and find the image, any image that you have taken. So that's the answer to that. Why do you need a good naming system for files and folders? Because it allows you to go find images. And if you look at this one, this person has all these, they had a folder called My Scan, so maybe they scanned a bunch of pictures and they did it by month. So you know, they could really tell when pictures were taken or when their scans were done or whatever. But you want the, the name, folder and file names to be short, descriptive rather than numeric or even by date, and then generic enough so that you know, they describe the photographs. So that'd be like if you have a folder, maybe one on a summer vacation, you'd have a folder called summer vacation, but then inside that folder, you might have other folders like Grand Canyon, Arches National Park, um, Denver Zoo, Elitches, you might have folders, so individual pictures go in those folders that are inside your summer vacation folder. Archiving, so, you know, again, this talks about archiving, saving onto CDs or DVDs. You can see that these are CDs they burned onto. And of course, the thing about this, once you have them on the CDs, you want to make sure you store your CDs in cool, dry places. Uh, only handle CDs by the edges, so you know those types of things already, I'm sure. Here's a little quiz activity, see how well you can do in the GOAT race. Now we're going to get on to the work, or the unit exam, sorry. It's a unit exam, so here's the exam preview over here for you to do that. So that's all I have for this unit. And then the assignment. This assignment is pictures about your house, and I'm going to create a separate um, recording for this. But this is going to be your first assignment where you're going to send in three pictures of your house. But I'm going to create a separate, maybe a five-minute recording for this. So for now, this recording is over. We've answered all of these questions. And for this week, here's all the work going to do for this week. This is everything you want to make sure you get completed. So thanks for watching, and I'll post the recording for the uh, photography assignment to go, that goes along with this unit. Thanks, everyone. Bye.